Welcome back to another episode of the Five Tool Baseball Podcast. I'm Dust McComas, joined once again by Drew Bishop, and we've got another big leaguer joining the show today. If you haven't figured out, if you're watching on YouTube, um, from my hat selection, uh, we're going to be joined by uh, a two-time All-Star member of the Los Angeles Dodgers, a guy that's finished in the top 15 of the MVP voting three times, uh, home run derby participant, um, and a guy that is a part of the Five Tool brand now. Uh, he is the name behind our big 14U event this summer. Um, Max Muncy will be joining the podcast today. Uh, a guy that uh, I'm a big fan of. Uh, he's been a mainstay on a lot of my fantasy baseball teams in the past years because he plays uh, a lot of positions, but the guy just mashes. Um, he's been doing it at a really high level. Uh, and a guy I'm, I'm anxious to talk to because he's had such an interesting career arc. You know, I, I, I want to ask him about just describing, you know, what that was like, what allowed him to, to reach the big league so quickly um, and then find himself kind of on the outside looking for an organization, another opportunity, and then getting back to the point that he's one of kind of one of the most feared power hitters um, in the national league right now. So really looking forward to this conversation with Max. Yeah. You know, I, I was, I say fortunate, probably unfortunate enough to go against Max quite a bit when I was on staff at Texas. Uh, he was just one of those guys that even at a young age took professional at bats. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I can probably count the number of guys that Coach Harmon said going to make it to the big leagues for sure. And he was on that list. So he had a lot of respect from our coaching staff and our players. Um, guys just always been able to hit. So it's, you know, it is, it's interesting that he's had such a, such a different path than so many big leaguers out there, but, you know, just goes to show you that the guys that, that can really hit and the guys that figure out how to battle adversity are the ones that are likely to, to be able to stay in the big leagues. Yeah. Like we always say, it's, it's never a linear path of development or success or growth or whatever. Oftentimes, even for the guys that, that are the best at the highest level, um, there are some down times, you know, some very low, uh, low moments so you got to kind of pick yourself and figure out what's going on and and uh and get back to playing at that high level again so uh really looking forward to this conversation so uh let's get to it here's our talk with dodgers infielder two-time all-star max muncie excited to be joined by another big leaguer a two-time all-star uh dodgers infielder max muncie max first off um, we were talking before we jumped on here. You're a new father, like Drew and I. We're a little bit more ahead of the game than, than you are, but um, how are things going with the little one in the house so far? Uh, it's been good. Um, you know, it's, it's been it's been a really fun time. Learning a lot, uh, a lot. I still need to learn about it, but <laughs> no, it's been it's been a lot of fun. She she's an amazing little girl, and uh, you know, just the past week or so, she's been starting to use her hands a lot. And, nice. Uh, starting to squirm around a little bit and uh, you know she she can really start to take in things with her eyes and so she gives you the biggest little smile when she recognizes you so it's so it's a really cool time right now and uh, you know nice. we're, we're really enjoying every every second of it how much uh, how much did your duties change in season because she was born in July right yeah she was born July 23rd yeah so have your duties changed in season versus off season um <laughs> <laughs> yeah a little a little bit um you know my my wife was great she tried to take all the responsibility during the season um you know tried to allow me to get any any kind of rest so that I was able to perform and uh you know once the off season did it was kind of like hey you know, pull your weight around <laughs> catch, yeah so, catch up um, yeah yeah so you know it's it, it we, I think we do a pretty good job of splitting it up um you know I try to help out as much as I can you know, there's only so much I can really do but yeah. I try to help out in any way I can yeah, I feel like you're at the point where they start to make facial expressions and it's like, oh, all the bottle washing and everything. It's a little it's a little more worth it now. But uh, man, you've had quite the year. I mean, uh, World Series championship in 2020. I know you're a proud Baylor Bears fan. They win the national title in basketball. Their football team's doing some great things. What's what's this last year, year and a half been like for you? Uh, well, I think it's been, it's the best way to describe it is crazy. And I think really anyone out there can describe the last couple of years is crazy with everything that's gone on, you know, with COVID and things getting shut down and reopened and shut down and, uh, you know, playing in front of no fans and the fans coming back, uh, you know, it's just been, it's been a whirlwind of a time. And, um, 
you know, not to say that two years is short, but the last two years have really felt, you know, way longer than what they should have for sure. But uh, yeah, it's been a wild time, uh, you know, between the World Series and then Baylor, uh, you know, their sports teams doing as good as they've been doing. It's, uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun for us, but uh, just a wild time. Yeah, we, you know, we, we talk about, uh, we've done some rankings of some of the 2022 and 23 classes in Texas full of kids. And we, lately we've been highlighting a lot of the Baylor classes, especially in 23, because they've done a really good job of getting some really talented players in there. I know Coach Rod and then uh, Coach Strauss and Mike Taylor do a really good job of finding guys that fit what they're looking to do. How much time do you get to interact with those guys at all? Or have you, have you spent any time around the program? Not as much as I would like, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I went down there several times and, uh, you know, I've gotten to know coach Rod quite a bit over the years and, you know, I, I really enjoy him. I always enjoy talking to him. Seems he's, he's a great guy. Uh, seems like he has a good control of that program. The players seem like they love playing for him. And, uh, you know, in my experience, that's kind of what makes or break a program. If you if you go somewhere, and all the players hate playing for a guy, you know, and it kind of, it doesn't matter how good of a team you have, it's not going to turn out well. And so, um, you know, it, it seems like all the guys enjoy playing for them and, uh, you, you know, they're, they're doing a great job down there and, uh, you know, hopefully I can make a trip or two before uh, the season starts, whenever that happens. Um, you know, it'd be nice to get down there and talk and talk to those guys again. I always enjoy going back. It's always fun, but um, yeah, I haven't had too much contact over the last year though. Now, you're officially a, a five-tool guy. I believe that you are the name behind our big 14U event um, this summer. And, and from talking to Brooks and Lynn, um, it, it seems like that that part of your baseball career, you know, that kind of that select club summer um, season made a big impact on you. Why be involved in that in that uh, level of competition? And, and what was it about those experiences that you think helped your growth as a player? I mean, almost all my memories of when I was a kid was out, out at the ball field, you know, and, uh, you know, the friends I had out there and, you know, just the, the memories, it's just, that's pretty much everything I can remember from being a kid is, you know, we'd spend, you know, and, you know, back then you go and your Saturday and Sunday tournaments, you're playing what, five, six games a day, something ridiculous like that. Uh, so I can, you know, I can remember that very clearly. And, uh, you know, I've, I've talked with, talked with Lynn about that quite a bit, you know, I can remember, um, going out to Arc Park, uh, you know, as a, a facility up here in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and you know, it'd be 110 degrees, and you, you, your first game's at eight in the morning. You play, and then you go straight to another field, and you play, you know, a game at 10, and you go, you have a break, so you're eating a hot dog and a Snickers bar at the concession stand. It's still 110 degrees, and so you're just, and you play two more games that day, and then you come back the next morning and you do it all over again. And it's like, you know, th those were wild to me, and uh, you know. That, that's when you kind of realized what, you know, did you let, did you like baseball or did you not like baseball? And, you know, for me, that was when I learned that I really loved baseball and it was something that I enjoyed doing. And, um, you know, that's why to me, it just, that, that was a time when I really discovered a lot and, um, you know, I'd like to help in any way I can and give back. And, uh, you know, it's just something that any way that I can make the game more appealing for kids is something I want to do because I want to be able to, you know, make sure, we have uh, a lot of young talent for the future for this game and um you know you, you see all these videos of kids out there there is a lot of talent out there and they, we need to make sure that they stay involved yeah you know I, most of the people that we've talked to in the game they all have people along the way whether it be at, at the youth level in high school in college in pro ball they all have people that stick out to them as as playing a huge role in not just their baseball development but as a person too, you know, like you said, the amount of time we spend, it just coincides. And because it's run, it runs together so much, you know, it's just a, it's a huge chunk of your life. Who are some people, you know, going back to those days at Art Park, um, you know, up until now that have really helped shape your, your baseball career and, you know, you as a person. Well, the biggest one was my dad, for sure. He was always my coach. Uh, no matter what team I played on growing up, he was my coach until I got to about um, – uh, until my sophomore year in high school. That was when he stopped coaching me. But uh, So he was really the biggest one. He taught me everything I knew about my swing. He uh, you know, taught me everything I knew about baseball, how to play the game, how to go out there and prepare. And, uh, you know, I definitely wouldn't be 
anywhere near the ball player I am today without him. So he's the biggest one for sure. And then just, you know, several coaches I had along the way. And, um, you know, when my dad stopped coaching me, I was lucky enough to play for Rusty Greer. Um, and he, he kind of taught me a whole nother side of it, you know, being a established big leaguer that he was, he, you know, he was able to teach a lot of us just a completely different way to show up and play and prepare for a baseball game. And, you know, that was really eye opening for me just to learn that, uh, you know, there's different ways to do it and there's more professional ways to do it. And, uh, you know, that was a, that was a huge one for me was being able to play for Rusty Greer. Yeah, sticking with that, Max, you know, how important is that? I mean, it's, we have a lot of recruiting coordinators on and, and, you know, Juco coaches and you hear all these guys discuss, I mean, Alex Bregman brought it up too. You know, he mentioned the word staying even keeled and, and having that consistent mental approach. I mean, how important is that to have success as you jump up the levels, whether it's going from high school to college or, or college to pro ball or the different levels of pro ball? I mean, how, how important is that mental approach um, to being able to sustain success at that level? Uh, it's really huge. You know, this, uh, uh, this game is so mental and it, it's, it can really get you down because, it, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's a sport that's based off failure. Uh, you know, if you – if you succeed three times out of 10, you're considered a hall of famer basically. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really wild when you start thinking a bit about it in terms like that. So uh, in order to weather that storm, you have to have a good mental approach and a good mental game. And that's something that you can train. And that's something that I didn't really learn until I got a little bit down the road that, um, you know, your mental approach to these things can be huge and learning how to keep, you know, uh, you know, my, my college coach, Steve Smith, used to always say, you keep your highs low and your lows high, and that way you can ride the wave out. And, um, you know, that, that was something that kind of stuck with me a little bit that, you know, when, when things are going bad, you got to find a way to stay up there. And when things are going good, you got to find a way to stay down so that you're not, you know, it's not too much of a, a, of a difference between when the other happens. Yeah, you know, you're a guy, too, that's kind of taken an unorthodox path you know, with the with the A's getting released, getting picked back up by the Dodgers, you know, fighting through it and being in the minor leagues after having been in the big leagues. You know, I don't think everyone understands how difficult a path that can be for some people. And some of the best players that have ever played our game have, have experienced that difficulty. So what kind of advice would you have for kids that, you know, maybe haven't had the easiest route of success to this point in their career and, you know, just sticking with it and ultimately coming out on top with all of it. I like to, I like to just say have fun. Um, Cause you know, up until, up until I got there with Oakland, I had never really experienced failure in my baseball career. You know, it was always kind of smooth sailing for me. Um, and then when that happened, you, I had to realize why was I playing the game? Why, you know, all the other stuff, like how do I get back to where I need to be? And uh, that was when I kind of, you know, it was a tough time for me because I realized I wasn't having any fun playing baseball. And it also hit me that it had nothing to do with the success or the failure at the time. I didn't really enjoy, I didn't really enjoy showing up to the park. I didn't enjoy, you know, everything that went with it. And uh, that definitely reflected with how I played on the field. And, um, you know, I've talked about it before. That was just a, you know, a dark time for me going through some depression and stuff like that. And, you know, you're sitting at home, opening day and you're watching a lot of your friends, you know, get called and run out to the line for the national anthem. And as, as the weeks go on, you kind of sit there and realize, Hey, this is, I, I kind of miss this. This is something I, I think I still want to do. You have to go through a big change mentally. And for me, that was realizing I need to go out there and act like I did when I was a kid. Um, you know, I need to go out there and just have fun. I need to be easy. I need to be free. And, um, you know, that's not to say I'm not going to get frustrated with when something bad happens because I'm competitive, but every time I go out there, I'm having the best time I can possibly have because I just want to have fun. I want to enjoy being out there with the guys. I want to enjoy being out there on the dirt, in the grass, having the bat in my hand, making a play. Um, you know, there, there's no reason why you shouldn't smile and have a good time doing all that. And uh, that, to me, that's the biggest advice I can always give kids is to make sure that you're having fun because if you're not having fun, what's the, what's the point of all of it? You know, you know it doesn't matter. And speaking of having fun, hitting home runs is fun. And that's something that you started to do a lot more of uh, when you joined the Dodgers. What, what went into that? I'm, I'm sure that's something you've been asked a million times, but like 
us being baseball nerds, we're always fascinated to hear guys at the highest level. Like what kind of clicked that just allowed you to, to start hammering the ball at the ballpark like you did? Uh, well, there was a couple of mechanical adjustments that I'm sure people have gone over. Um, the swing didn't so much change. It was just how I entered into my swing. Uh, the biggest adjustment for me was mentally. Um, you know, I was always a guy that prided myself on being able to, you know, take my walks and get the pitch I wanted to, you know, hit. Uh, that translated into being too passive and I wasn't ready to hit when I did get that pitch. And so I'd foul it off where I'd miss it a lot of times. And so for me, the biggest adjustment really was mentally going up there ready to hit. And, um, you know, it sounds stupid and silly and simple, but that really kind of was all it was, was just having a mental switch to be more aggressive, knowing that tr trust my eyes, trust my approach, trust my game plan, that if I'm not getting the pitch I want, I can still hold off and take it. But that way I'm always ready for that pitch that I do get. And when I get it, I'm not going to miss it. And so far uh, it's been working out for me. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we talk about having fun. Like, you've been in the American League. You've been in the National League. Do you have certain ballparks or certain cities that you just really enjoy going to more than others? Or is there a ballpark that you like hitting in versus one that you don't? Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a lot of great, great ballparks out there. You know, Pittsburgh, for example, is a great one with the city, the backdrop and everything. That's an unbelievable stadium. Um, I love Seattle. Um, you know, I like the city of Seattle. It's, it's fun going there. The, you know, it, you, you just feel like you're breathing in really fresh air when you're in Seattle. The stadium there is awesome. It's always a good environment. Um, you know, for us, going to San Diego is always quite, quite an experience. Um, you know, in the past, it was fun because we'd go down there and we'd sell out the stadium with 90% Dodger fans. Uh, this past year or two, it's been 90% Padres fans, so it's been a little bit oh. different, and, you know, they get to be pretty hostile, so that's that's always a fun environment. Um, as far as hitting, um, you know, it's hard to get away from Coors Field. Uh, that's that's <laughs> a, great, a great place to hit. Uh, uh, you know, I just feel like, I, like, you know, not only does the ball carry, I just feel like I see the ball really well there. Um, you know, I've always enjoyed hitting there. Um I, I like I, I like Dodger Stadium. That's that's honestly it's my favorite spot. I like see I like seeing the ball there. I like hitting the ball there. I like the fans, the the atmosphere. Um, you know, I I really 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 enjoyed Dodger Stadium. Yeah, but, uh, you get that you get that organ too. That's that that <laughs> like to me that cloud like that guy is some of the stuff he's able to play on there is just incredible. Like so, when the schedule comes out, do all the hitters kind of get together and all right, this is when we go to course. This is when this is when we get hot and we we get our we get to pad our numbers a little bit. Um, no, I wouldn't say that's the case. But uh, um, you know, whenever you do go to Coors, it's always uh, it's always kind of you look around at each other and you go, hey, you know, if you're in a slump, this is when you got your slump. Get you a couple when you know <laughs> maybe a, maybe a broken bat here or there. You know, you know, just uh balls that are normally not hits in other places find they find grass at Coors Field so uh sometimes that can really get you going what about off the field any any food any towns that you particularly like the food I know I used to some guys I played with they always liked going to Chicago in the National League because back then I guess more often than now they they would play a lot of day games so they'd get to have a a normal dinner do y'all ever get a chance to go and eat to any fun restaurants or do yeah. different stuff. Um, so usually we like to, you know, when we get into a city, a travel day, um, you know, unless you're flying after a game, you usually get in um, at a fairly decent time. And so, uh, you know, a lot of times the team will look, we'll go out to eat, not the whole team, but, you know, they're always a group of 10 to 15 guys and we'll go find a nice restaurant, a nice steakhouse and we'll do that. Uh, you know, Chicago is a, a good one. That's for sure. They have some really good restaurants there. Um, you know, DC is another good one. There's a lot of really good restaurants in DC. Um, you know, New, New York's always fun to me because uh, you go yeah. out there because you go out there you go out during lunchtime and they have all the food the food carts and the food stands and you know people always think oh that's not a good thing to eat but the, the food at those food stands is really good. It's, oh yeah. You know, yeah. Then you walk down the street and you get the smells from it and it's uh, you know that that's always a fun one to me and. Uh, you know, of course, the the Florida uh, teams, you know, Miami and Tampa, you get some good food down there. So what was more enjoyable for you, getting to design your own bobblehead or, or telling a pitcher to go get it out of the ocean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, maybe the bobblehead for me. The, the, the getting out of the ocean thing, I was just spur of the moment. Um, you know, a lot of good came from that. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. And I still hear a lot about it. But, you know, the bobblehead with, uh, with me and Jax, my dog, that was really cool. Um, uh, I have one up there, but it's, it's, I need to get a ladder to get it down. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I'd show you guys. But, yeah, it's, that, that, that was a really cool moment. Me and my wife sat down and we, you know, we kind of was, you know, what would be a good, good design. And, you know, we talked with the, with, with the guys and they, they, they sent this design back. We, we said, we, Hey, maybe we can do something with our dog. And they sent this design back and it worked out great. And, you know, we loved it. And uh, we had a lot of fans commenting on it and uh, you know, it sold out pretty quickly, I think. So, so it's uh, uh, you know, that was a pretty cool moment for me. That's great. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we've been asking people, you know, we didn't get to play in the era of NIL and having all the deals and all that. If you were playing now, in in Waco do you have any specific deals that you think you would have been trying to get as a as a Baylor Bear um that's probably most of our yeah most of ours most of Dustin and I's are they're always food related they're always food related yeah you know yeah I feel like there'd be one you know maybe Uncle Dan's barbecue would be a good one for me in Waco um you know everyone everyone would probably always say VTEX for me, but I'm not a huge fan of the gut pack. So I'd go with uncle Dan's, um, uh, you know, a funny one would be Fazoli's because that, yeah. you know, everyone, they, they used to give out the coupons after the games. If you scored like four runs or whatever, you get free Fazoli's. And so, uh, that, yeah. that'd be a funny one. Um, a couple others, I'm not going to mention those though. One of them's a bar. I think that'd be pretty fun. Uh, <laughs> get a, get a, you know, and I deal with a bar. I think that'd be really cool. What are you, crickets? Uh, no, I'd go with Stuffy <laughs> Murphy's. Okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've had a beer or two there before. Um, yeah. You know, be, being on that Dodgers team, you guys have experienced so much success, but I, I feel like that's um, maybe not characters, but you've got a lot of different kind of personalities on that team too. I mean, what's it been like playing around some of those guys, you know, Mookie Betts joins the organization not too long ago. I know he's not with you guys anymore, but um, do you even talk to Max Scherzer on a day he starts or do you just kind of avoid him? But what's it like being like going to the ballpark every day and being surrounded by those guys? I got to imagine, you know, as a competitor too, it pushes you to want to be at your best every day. I imagine because you're surrounded by so many great players. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, everyone is so unique and you know, how they, prepare for a game and uh you know that's one of those things that you definitely get better from watching other people with how they prepare and you know you would hope that they would get better from watching you on how you prepare and uh you know for me I like to watch pitchers um you know I, I like to look at how they prepare like look at how they go through their scouting reports how they go through you know how they're going to pitch a certain lineup and I like to try and take that and apply it to myself when I'm doing my you know research on a pitcher and um you know we, we do have a lot of personalities and you know i'm not going to yeah, i'm not going to disclose what what they do on their you know their start routines but you know like for you like you said for example scherzer is a is a complete different guy from kershaw on their start day you know scherzer likes to have fun he likes to be loose until about you know 30 minutes before the game and then it's you know go time for him whereas kersh is locked in the whole day and so it's you know like i said i'm not going to say what all they do but you know that, that's two completely different personalities and then when it's not their start day, it's the, you know, it's completely different in the opposite almost. So it's, um, you know, everyone is so unique and, you know, we've had so many great personalities on the Dodgers and, you know, a couple of my favorite personalities aren't, aren't there anymore, you know, with, with Jock and Kike and those guys, you know, they, they kept the clubhouse real light and real fun, but, um, you know, we still do have quite a bit. Mookie's always a great guy, belly, nonstop laughs out of belly. Uh, you never know what's going to come out of that guy's mouth and it's great. Yeah, those two guys you named, I think, are, are good examples of, of guys that sort of have those winning it intangibles, you know, like, is that something that, you know, maybe the baseball community kind of undervalues a little bit? Because you hear so much about tools and skill and velocity and talent, all these things. But like, you see a lot of these guys that hang around the big leagues, and they just do a lot of things that, that help teams win games. And it might not show up with the gaudy stats. Yeah, you know, baseball is moving so towards analytics, which is great. Um, you know, it can help out a lot of people. But one thing analytics can't tell you is, uh, uh, you know, the chemistry of a clubhouse or whether or not a guy just knows how to win. Um, you know, when it comes like for pitchers, example, we devalue the win stat so much nowadays. And at the end of the day, what are you trying to do? You're trying to win the game. 
So it's just like, you know, we're, we're devaluing winning the actual game so much for all these underlying, you know, analytics that, um, it, you know, it's, 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 it's tough because at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is win a game. And there's certain guys that just know how to do it. And there's no formula for it. There's no, uh, you know, there's no description for it. There's no reason for how, why they can do it. They just can and, you know, we've always had a lot of those guys. And it's, you know, it's just, you, you see it with guys around the league that just keep getting job after job after job. You know, Mike Napoli is the one that always stands out for me. Mm -hmm. Every year that guy was on a playoff team. And if he wasn't on a playoff team, he got traded for because he knew how to win. He knew how to keep the clubhouse, you know, loose. And he, he kept everything going well. And, you know, that's just one of those guys that you, they're always on a playoff team. And there's a reason for it. And analytics can't really describe that. Yeah, I think it's interesting you touched on that. You know, I, I always get a kick out of listening to post-championship game interviews because I always feel like no matter what, everyone they talk to says the same thing, right? You can tell they win because they're all on the same page. And I was actually listening to a podcast the other day that had Pete Carroll and Dave Roberts. And he, uh, Dave said that, you know, his biggest – task is managing personalities and so he he spends a lot of time just bouncing around and tries to make it a point to to talk to just every guy on the team at some point throughout the day and that's just a huge part of what a at, a, at the pro level a manager's role is so you know do you see like do you see a huge difference in different levels of, from college to professional coaches and and managers how they handle a team in that regard yeah, you know, it's it's completely different. You know, when you're in college, it's, um, you know, it, it's a yes, sir, no, sir, yes, coach, no coach, you know, uh, hey, we're going to do this. Okay, the whole team's going to do it. We're going to practice this way. We're going to do that. When you get in a pro ball, if you call someone coach, they're going to chew you out and they're going to get so pissed at you. You don't <laughs> never call them coach. You call them, you know, you say by their name, you know. And for me, it's, it's Doc. And, you know, I, I say, you know, I say, hey, Doc, you know, hey, Doc this, hey, Doc that. It's never, hey, Coach Roberts or anything like that. You know, every now, every now and then you get a creative, say, hey, Skip, or, you know, something like that. But, um, you know, Pro Bowl, you, just, you know, it's they're, – they're an extension of the team, really. And so that's something that you see a lot. And I think Doc does that about as good as anybody. He finds a way to manage the clubhouse really, really well. And whether it's for good or for bad, he, he can keep the clubhouse close. And, um, you know, that's something that's kind of a unique trait with managers. And – that's something you see a lot with teams that win. That's something you see a lot with teams that kind of fall apart and don't win is that the manager can't hold the clubhouse. And, you know, we've seen that with a couple of teams that have a lot of really good talent and should win and they end up don't. And that's a lot of times it has to do with not decisions that are made on the field or plays that happen on the field it has to do with the fact that the clubhouse hates each other. It, one thing we try to do is a lot of these podcasts is kind of be educational for those high school players that are talented enough to be college guys or pro guys, or we're certainly at that level to have that conversation. Well, what would be one piece of advice you'd give those guys, or maybe one thing that you realized later on in your career that you wish you realized earlier in your career that kind of helped your development? I don't know. I don't know if I have one specific answer. There's too much. There's too much information. I'd like to give my younger self. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, um, you know, you, you can always get better. You never know, you never know everything. Um, you know, I got to be teammates with Albert Pujols and even he was still learning things and he's been around in the game for 800 years. You know, it's, uh, it's just one of those things that if, if a guy like that can still learn things, if a guy like Clayton Kershaw can still learn how to pitch and how to do certain things on the mound, you, you, you never stop learning. And to think that you know it all or to think you know more than someone else about a certain uh, topic, uh, you should never be that way. If, if Maybe you do things differently than someone else, but listen to what they have to say, because maybe you can take a piece here or a piece there and add it into what you do. Uh, you, you never know it all, and you, you're always learning in the game. Now, when you're around the house with the little one, you know, how's the elbow doing? Do you have to carry her in, in one arm or... Or, or, or what's that what's that rehab process been like for you? It's been slow. Um, you know, every, everything's, I, I say it's been slow. Everything's been going as it should. There's been no setbacks or anything. It's just, you know, it's a slow process. It's a, it's a, it was a big time injury. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things where it was, it was a dislocated elbow. It was a, a torn UCL, a torn other ligament. 
um, you know, a bunch of other stuff happened in there. And it, it just takes time to heal. And it's one of those things where you want to be out doing things and you can't. And, uh, you know, that's been the most frustrating thing for me is, you know, I, like I want to do things with my daughter. And sometimes you can't always do it because you got to hold back with the arm. And, you know, like, you know, all my friends are out golfing and I can't do that. Um, you know, it's just, it, this is the time of year where you try to enjoy your life because, you know, you actually have some free time and, uh, you know, it really sucks because you can't do that. And that, that, you know, it's just, it's really hard to, you know, grasp that sometimes you always want to go out there and do it, but you gotta, you have to hold back. Yeah, we're, uh, you know, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, you, you've had so many big moments. I mean, you guys have played in so many postseason games. Lately, I mean, when you guys have gotten it rolling, it, it just hasn't stopped. Do you have a you have a favorite homer, favorite hit, favorite moment from from those recent seasons that um, just kind of sticks out above the rest for you? Uh, I mean, there's you've a had few. some big ones. Yeah, there's a few. Um, you know, I had a big hit against the Rays off of uh, Charlie Morton in the World Series. Uh, uh, it was the one RBIs or two RBIs. I can't exactly remember, but. Um, you know, that was a, that was a big at bat, worked full count. Um, Charlie left a cutter over the middle of the plate and I was able to get in the center field. That one sticks out to me. Um, you know, another big at bat against the Rays in that World Series run against uh, uh, Pete Fairbanks. I had a really good hit off him that scored an RBI. Um, you know, the, the, those little hits stick out to me more than the home runs do sometimes. Because it's just, uh, you know, the whole point of playing the game is you go out there and try to win. And that's always been my, you know, MO is I just want to win no matter what. So for me, the, the little things like that that get jobs done kind of stick out more than just a home run does to me. Do you have, are there any guys that, you know, not necessarily the frontline guys, but are there just any guys that you see, you know, come down the pike over the next week or so and you're just like, God, I just, I, I, I hate hitting off this guy. Just don't <laughs> like it. Yeah, uh, Luis Castillo <laughs> from Cincinnati. Um, I think my career numbers off this guy are like 0 for 13 with 12 strikeouts or 11 strikeouts, something like that. I just cannot put the ball in play off this guy. I don't understand why. I mean, I mean, I understand why he's nasty, but like, <laughs> I, you know, I've faced nasty pitchers before and I'm at least able to put them in play. Maybe I don't have a hit off them, but whenever I face him, it's just, I, I, I have a hole in my bat. I'm swinging a tennis racket with no net. Um, you know, it's just, I, I don't understand. I, I really can't figure it out. Hopefully, hopefully sometime soon I'll, I'll get a hit off him or maybe that'll be the day that I, I start getting off in the future. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. He's got some nasty stuff for sure. Yeah. Is it how much on the others, on the flip side of that, is there any guys that you just, that, ha, that are really good, you know, numbers wise that you just feel like you see really well? Um, Uh, not none really stick out, you know. Uh, I, there is a guy from the Angels, uh, Felix Pena. I think I've got like four home runs off him, but I don't necessarily like facing him. I just have good numbers. Um, <laughs> you know, he throws a lot of sliders, and a lot of times they back up and do weird things. And um, you know, like I said, it's not necessarily someone I like facing, but I do have good numbers off him. And same with there's another guy from uh, Colorado who. I might have four or five home runs off of his reliever, uh, Carlos Estevez, but he's not fun to face either because he's throwing a hundred coming at you and he's like yeah. six foot eight or something like that. He's a monster. <laughs> so, you know, I have good numbers off those guys, but not necessarily people that I enjoy facing. So, um, yeah, I don't know if there's anyone that I really just enjoy facing a lot. You know, it's the big leagues. Those guys are all good. There's, there's not really anyone that's a comfortable at that. Yeah, that's, that's the truth. Uh, at the Dodgers are kind of always on the forefront of, of kind of what's next in baseball do you do you hitters ever go to those those r d and pitching development guys and say hey let's cool let's cool out you know the the pitch shaping thing and all like let's let's tone this down and stop spreading this around the game because it's it's hard enough to hit right now i gotta imagine like the scotty reports and prep for hitters now has probably changed so much in recent years and it feels like the pitch shape stuff is constantly changing even throughout the course of a single season yeah, you know, it, it's it's very tough to keep up with the pitching side. Um, they're so far ahead of us technologically and everything else. You know, you, you just can't really keep up with them. We're doing the best we can. You know, they've got pitching machines now where you can enter in certain, um, you know, like pitch data, like the spin rate and, you know, which, which direction it's spinning. So you can get close to mimicking, you know, 
the movement of their pitches, but uh, we're just so far behind on them. You know, there's there's not really a way to increase your bat speed like there is to increase your spin rate or increase your you know velocity. It's just it's not really there. You either have it or you don't. And when it comes to pitching, you always hear the stories of the guys that throw 88 and now they throw 98 because they were able to do this. It, it's really hard to do that when it comes to hitting. We're just so far behind, and uh, you know they're they're coming up with things. Uh, I know Marucci does a bat testing thing where they, it, it's kind of like a golf, you know, have you ever gotten fitted for golf clubs? You go there and you swing, mm -hmm. you know, five swings with a thousand clubs or whatever. It's kind of like that. And they figure out which one you have the the best bat path with. Um, you know, there's, there's little things like that, that we're trying to catch up, but at the end of the day, we're just really far behind. Yeah. Augie Ag always said it was, we have it backwards because we're the only sport that the, that the defense has the ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, those guys are definitely on the attack for sure. But, uh, well, Max, man, thanks so much for, for taking some time out of your day. And I, I'm sure the little one's going to be demanding your attention soon. If, if she's not napping right now, I know, um, my household was fired up that daycare was back open today after about two weeks with <laughs> you just like, there's only so many times you can watch Coco in, in a two week span um, yeah. and try to and try to entertain a toddler while a pandemic's going on so uh we were pretty excited that the daycare is, is back but uh thanks again so much for the time man it's been a great conversation and uh best of luck with with the elbow rehab we hope to see you back out there soon um hitting homers i mean it's been really fun to watch your career um really transform with the dodgers and playing such a big part of, of their success which has been as good as anybody in baseball so far yeah well thanks for having me on guys i appreciate it and uh, you know, I always tell Lynn, if there's anything you guys ever need from me, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to help out. Happy to help out Five Tool any way I can. You know, just, just let me know, guys. Yeah, we might need to test out some Sounds max good. bats. We might need to get in the cage and, and, and test some max bats and, and see which one fits us the best. That might be some fun content in the future. <laughs> ah, yeah, just let me know. I'll make a couple calls, and we'll see what we can do for it. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Max, man. Best of luck, and we really appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks again to Dodgers two-time All-Star Max Muncie for joining the podcast. Uh, man, we've had, we haven't just had big leaguers on. Uh, we've had some two guys that are doing it at the highest level. I mean, you're talking about a guy who was in a home run derby. Um, I saw it, he's finished inside the top 15 in MVP voting, I believe, two or three times. Um, he's done it uh, three times. He had a top 10 finish this past season. Um, doing some really big things for arguably the, the, the best organization in baseball um, right now. Some really insightful stuff. Um, Drew, what, what, what are some things that stuck out with you? I mean, you know, we talked about just his career arc um, and how that, you know, uh, he reached the big leagues with Oakland. And it, it didn't work and um, actually got released and kind of had to rediscover himself. And, and boy, did he rediscover himself because he's he's been a force with the Dodgers ever since. Well, yeah, it's, you know, something we talk about a lot. There's no easy path. You know, the guys that have it easy are few and far between. So, you know, just staying positive And like he said, finding a way to have fun with playing baseball is really what kept him in the game. Um, you know, it's a, it's a hard game. It's a game of failure. Uh, but being able to have a strong mental game and really push through it and find ways to make it fun and then, enjoy what you're doing where things are really important to him. Yeah. You know, you, you hear a guy like that, that's, you know, been in professional baseball for such a long time. And he's talking about the importance of, of making sure you're having fun in the game. And you know, I think that's something that young players sometimes can, can kind of lose sight of because, you know, you you play so many games and you're so focused on like, Oh, I, I've got to, I've got to achieve this goal. Like I've got to get a D one scholarship or I've got to do this, or I've got to do that. And you play nonstop in the summer, or you might play nonstop in the fall. And then you got your high school season. And like, um, it's kind of easy sometimes to lose sight of, of why you started playing the game. And I, that's, you know, I, I didn't expect that, that answer when I asked him, I, I know, I, I know it's something he's been asked so much, like, you know, cause he was kind of a revelation. Like he's a guy that, that, you know, was a really talented player. Obviously, he reached the big leagues at age 24. As a guy that came out of college, he got through the minor league system pretty quick. So, obviously, he was doing some really good things. 
Um, and and uh, then he gets released and goes to Dodgers and starts smashing homers all of a sudden. So that's kind of what I was expecting. But you know, we talked about like, you know, there was a there was a dark period there where, you know, he just was kind of depressed and because and, you know, he wasn't having fun with the game anymore. And I, I think that that's something that can, young people can learn a lesson from that are playing the game. Like, hey, like if it's not fun, something's wrong. Um, you know, and don't, don't have your fun be dictated by like your success or your statistics or, or, or whatever it is, or feel like you've got to go get a hundred swings in every day or something like that. Like you got to be able to have fun, um, with the game and, uh, some, some really, uh, insightful stuff from him and candid stuff too. I'm, I'm sure that that's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not often you hear big league guys talk about, uh, something like that, but it reinforces just how important it is. Like no matter the level, as you, as the levels go up. I mean, that, that enjoyment and that fun and that preparation element, things like that, I've got to stay the same. Well, another thing you talked about too, is just always learning and trying to get better. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that's something that uh, a lot of kids face now, possibly at a younger age with the early commitments. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, if you're a freshman or sophomore and you commit somewhere, you know, maybe it's subconsciously, but you know, there may be, there may be a chance that you don't take things as seriously or you're not quite as hungry as someone who's out there just fighting for an offer or fighting to find a place to play. Um, but you know, the best guys I've been around, they're always curious and they're always wanting to learn. And I think that's part of what Tulo brought to the Texas program when I was there is, you know, that guy is an all-star, um, potentially one of the best shortstops to ever play the game. And he all, all he wanted to do was continue learning and figure new things out. And as soon as you kind of lose that hunger to improve or just keep getting better, or if you think you have it figured out, you're probably done improving and yeah, you're not going to go yeah. much further in the game. Yeah, no, that's a great point. You know, what was the money ball quote from Billy Bean, like evolve or die or something like that? Like this game is constantly changing. Like no matter what level you're at, um, you're not going to, I mean, Max Muncy referenced Albert Pujols still being a guy that was still trying to learn. Like, I mean, that's a guy that's in the conversation as the best right-handed hitter ever in baseball. And, and he goes to a new team and he's trying to learn. And I think if you, the, the more, you know, if we're fortunate enough to keep having these big league guys on, I think that that's something we'll see or, or hear that's a consistent theme amongst those conversations you hear those guys talk about how much they learn from their teammates, whether it's pitchers learning from other pitchers about a grip or a preparation element or, or something like that, or, or hitters, you know, a asking each other, Hey, how do you see this pitcher? What do you think in here? What are you doing with your swing? Like, I mean, these guys are always trying to learn. And that's why those guys that are at the top of the game, uh, it's one of the reasons why they're so good is they have to keep learning because the game keeps changing, you know, like, right. yeah, the changes in the game at the high school level are, are, are not as drastic as they are in the professional levels or the college levels and things like that. But um, the game keeps changing and you've got to approach it with, with an humble attitude that like, I've got to be willing to, to tell myself, I don't know everything. I, I'm not close to knowing everything um, and, and still try to continue to learn. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, when he name dropped Albert Poulos as a guy that's still trying to learn. I mean, it just kind of opens your eyes because that guy's been in professional baseball um, doing it at the highest level for a really long time. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, being part of an organization like that, that puts so much emphasis on the analytics, you know, you're, you're probably bound to be a little bit curious yes. at some point too. So, you know, even if it's not the specific analytics that you're really learning, just the curiosity and the process of learning will keep you improving or evolving, you know, if, if you take it the right way, um, you know, but at the same time, one of the things that he mentioned that, you know, that something we can't measure is just being a winner. Yes. You know, it's just, it's something that the Dodgers have really capitalized on by having that perfect mix of both. Right. They they put a heavy emphasis on the analytics, but it also seems like they have the human element of it down too. Um, you know, I thought it was interesting and it's not um doesn't seem like a secret, but he mentioned certain players like Kike Hernandez and you know, and then later Mike Napoli, like he was right, like those guys always end up on teams in the postseason. 
And it, you know, there, there's a value to that. And, you know, any, any team that I've ever been a part of that's won anything significant has guys like that. And you can't, you know, you, you can't put a price or a, or a number to the value of it, but, but it exists. And, you know, that just, that's what, that's why the teams on paper that are the best on paper aren't always the ones that win. And that's a great explanation of it, but having that, that, that perfect combo is what I think teams are really looking for. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, I'm glad he mentioned it because, you know, I'm a, I'm as big of an analytics guy as, as I, a person like me can be, but I get frustrated sometimes when you see guys kind of push back on, on the human element involved in this, you know, whether it's, you know, chemistry or the it factor or guys having hot streaks or cold streaks or outside, you know, I'm sure for Max, it was tough being away from his daughter. So like during the season, like, you know, you've, you've got a newborn home, like that stuff can affect guys, you know, it can affect the mood of, and, and just like the Kike Hernandez is and the Mike Napoli's and, uh, you know, Johnny Gomes was a guy like that, that I feel like just bounced around winning team after winning team um, all over the time. And, you know, they called Jock Peterson October, Jocktober, like his regular season wasn't, wasn't great. You know, he gets into the playoffs and some of those guys just, just had that sort of impact. But I think it's a great lesson for, for players that like, you don't have to have the loudest tools. You don't have to have the highest grades. You don't have to have the most skill necessarily, you've got to have a certain level of those in order to keep playing and jumping the levels and have success and things like that. But being a guy that brings a lot of winning qualities to the field, um, just figuring out ways to win games like that, that matters. You know, the Max Muncy's of the world are, are in a clubhouse that's as talented and as good as any in baseball. And they're talking about how much that sort of stuff matters. So, um, you know, it's a really great point by him and uh, just a great conversation. Uh, uh, I hope he wasn't too, I hope he wasn't upset with me with referencing the bum garner thing, because I, I mean, that, that's, that's like one of the, the, the best like pitcher hitter interaction moments of like the last 10 years is because that's, those are two guys that are extremely competitive. I mean, bum garner, we know, I mean, he's about yeah. as old school competitive as it gets And uh, Muncie. I mean, they have, I think he's actually, has the shirt and i've seen him wearing it before in photos like to go get it out of the ocean shirt so uh a really fun conversation with him i'm glad he joined us and and he's a five tool official guy now i mean he is the name behind the 14u uh, world series event which is going to be super fun to uh, to be a part of yeah we're going to put by by the end of this we're going to have a pretty good lineup of of guys that are hosting our uh host uh host for their namesake of our events with with him and bregman and mattingly and you know, it's Pudge. So, yeah, we got to get some yeah. pitchers. We got to get somebody on the pitcher side. You know, we're gonna have a. I'm, I'm kind of optimistic too. We well, might, we might get no, a Max I'm, bat in the mail, and maybe some Bregman salsa, and like you know, maybe Mattingly will will let us come hang out in in, in Miami for a little bit. You know, I'm I'm kind of getting my hopes up about this now. Well, our offense might be good enough that you and I are able to be yeah. the, the pitching yeah. staff. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll give you some innings. We promise we have the will to win. We'll keep our team in the game. Yeah, we're good we're good chemistry guys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's how you know these guys aren't, don't have the most talent in the world when you, when you're talking about the chemistry element for us, but uh, great conversation with him and really appreciate him coming on board and uh, uh, you can get to uh, to pod being an Apple podcast and I'm, I'm sure we'll get this up on YouTube eventually. Um, if you guys want to kind of tune in and I, I wore my Dodgers hat um, to show Max and the Dodgers some love uh, one time amateur consultant program member with the Los Angeles Dodgers back in my amateur scouting days so um, shout out to them and shout out to Max but yeah um, you can follow him on Instagram um, and I know there he does some stuff with St. Jude um, kind of like helping contribute to that that charity Um, you know he's a big big fan of his dog and obviously his daughter now as well Uh, you can follow Max on Instagram and on Twitter and uh, I'm sure he'll be around some hopefully be around some um, you know, with, with five tool in the future, now that he's part of this 14 U event, and, uh, the more big leaguers we can add, the, the better. Uh, Cause those guys just, it's cool to see those guys when they want to give back and be a part of, of the next wave of players um, and hear them talk about how, like, we got to make sure that those talented guys keep, keep playing baseball, um, yeah. which we know is something that, that baseball does run into on occasion. Yeah. Well, you know, the guys that get it and understand how big of an impact our game has, you know, and, there's so many not just lessons you learn from baseball but life 
life wise that you learn yeah. from our game, you know, that serve you well on down the road. And that's why people like you and me are still involved in this. And, you know, it's just, it, it's great that we have guys like, like Max and like Alex that are, that are concerned with that and really want to be involved and in, in help pass that tradition on. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Uh, have you, have you recovered from the NFL side or, or are we, uh, how, how, uh, how did, how did we handle uh, that? I mean, it was fine. Uh, you know, <laughs> like they played poorly. A lot of things happened in Arizona's favor to help win. So, you know, now that, the game's over and it's likely that we play them again first round. I'm glad it kind of shook out that way a little bit, just the way the Cowboys typically respond to success. is not great. So I feel better about playing them after having a, a close frustrating loss yeah. versus having beaten them pretty bad and then losing to them when it really matters. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but at the same time, I don't like Kyler's a tricky matchup for, for the Dallas defense, just Especially because in that stadium, well, he, you know, he, he's able to negate their biggest strength, you know, or at least neutralize it a little bit. Yeah. Him, him and Aaron Rodgers are the two guys that I don't want to face the most in the playoffs, but which sounds crazy when you consider that I'm leaving Brady off that list, but right. I think what they do best can affect him a little bit more than those other two guys. Yeah. But, that's, that's quite the list of quarterbacks, um, you know, and I'm, I'm about to have to face reality, not knowing what my quarterback situation oh, hey, is going, going back to the Steelers game last night. You can't get the home clock operator to pay attention. Yeah. And get the curtain well, call, right. You know, how, I was trying to think like, when's the last time a curtain call happened in the NFL? Like, I don't we know, know, but like that, like that was as clear as day. They sent yeah. him back out there. Yeah. And I mean, the re they even called timeout and the I refs heard, yeah. blew the whistle. Yeah, that would have been a really cool moment. And, like, I didn't even think Tomlin would have the awareness to do that. Because um, it was weird because, like, everybody was kind of not tiptoeing it, but it was like, is he really going to be done, like, type thing? Because he didn't come out and, like, say, hey, this is it. He said, that, like, all signs are pointing to that. Obviously, after last night, we know now that that was it. But I was trying to think, I was like, when is the last time – an NFL guy has gotten a curtain call like that. Like, I mean, Antonio Brown created his own curtain call, but that was obviously a, a, a much different situation. <laughs> that, that, uh, that, it, yeah. How about Antonio Brown posting on Twitter after he walks out of the stadium, just waiting for his Uber. He tweets a photo of himself waiting for his Uber. Um, and then like the Uber driver or cab driver, or whatever, like videoed him. And then he showed up to the net scan. Like, Oh man, I, I hope mentally he's okay. The, the biggest accomplishment he's of not. Mike Tomlin's career is not too is not winning a Super Bowl. It's it's dealing with Antonio Brown for nine years. So, um, yeah, it's 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 gonna be weird. Like, well, he's a go, lot like Dave Roberts. He he knows how to he knows how to manage the personalities. Yeah, and that's why yeah, he's that's, never had and, a losing season. And that's and that's a much bigger part than than I mean, I'd put it up. I'd say that's more important than the X's and O's element. No, no. is at the professional level managing all those personalities but yeah it's uh you've got your quarterback situation secure and i'm about to enter a world where i don't know what they're going to do at quarterback for the first time in 18 years and that's that's a really really weird thing to go through as a fan like i i have no bad, idea what they're going to do bad Not, time to have a bad quarterback draft yeah, like, you know, am I going to put my faith in, like, Sam Howell or somebody like that? Like, I saw, like, the Cincinnati quarterback got mocked to the Steelers the other day, and I was like, nah, I don't, I don't know about that one. That one doesn't really exist. Let's go take that center from Iowa. I'd much rather have that guy. Um, and it's just yeah, – so you, you see last night, too, the Steelers, like, coaching changes. Like, the offensive line coach left to go to Oregon, and they started a new lineup, and all of a sudden, Najee Harris had his best game running the football – of the season so i'm optimistic talking about but, another guy not knowing the circ oh circumstance. Yeah, yeah he breaks that long run yeah. he could have given ben the curtain call yeah too if he would have just yeah. slid they, they asked him about that and like <laughs> i think they told him to go down and he was like no i'm scoring <laughs> and he just how, think stuff. of how think of how many fantasy fantasy uh championships that oh, play swung. Man. 
A he lot. May have been, he may a have lot. had it himself in fantasy. That may have been a, a lot. Yeah, part. because you know he was a, a first round pick in almost every league. So and he performed like it. So those teams probably had a good opportunity to go go deep in the playoffs. But man, like that's oof. That that probably that, swung that a would lot fall of under money. the yeah, that would probably fall under the bad beat category. Yeah, for Van, for Van speaking Pelt. of bad beats, um, Alex Dunlap lost uh, the big league I'm in that had been in forever with catching a couple other guys. He had Jamar Chase and lost by like a fraction of a point in the title game because the other guy had Russell Wilson who just went nuts in that afternoon game. Uh, yeah, imagine having Jamar Chase and, and, and scoring like 170 points and losing in the fancy title game that that is a bad beat but uh anyway we've talked enough about football and fancy football again thanks to max munty for joining and uh you can find those podcasts at all the usual spots and if you listen to us on apple podcasts it would really help us if you left a five-star review if you think we're worthy of a five-star review uh it helps us kind of get get into people's search engines and things like that so we appreciate that but uh until we talk to y'all next time have a good week hope you're having a good new year and take care